I'm now continuing on with the second part of Edward Edinger's The Aeon Lectures, paragraph 73 to 77. Jung continues his discussion of the God image in paragraph 73. Quote, the God image in man that was damaged by the first sin can be reformed with the help of God. The totality images which the unconscious produces in the course of an individuation process are similar reformations of an a priori archetype. This is in exact agreement with the empirical findings of psychology that there is an ever-present archetype of wholeness which may easily disappear from the purview of consciousness or may never be perceived at all until a consciousness illuminated by conversion recognizes it. As a result of this anamnesis, the original state of oneness with the God image is restored. Jung mentions four different words for this restoration which relate to the return of the state of wholeness. They all have very rich associative connections. The words are reformation, renewal, anamnesis, and apocatastasis. Apocatastasis is a term Jung was fond of. He uses it quite a few times in his works. It is important to understand the word as it leads to an understanding of the essential nature of Jungian analysis. This word shows up only once in the New Testament. In Acts 3, 19 and following, Peter is speaking to a crowd of people. Quote, now you must repent and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out and so that the Lord may send the time of comfort. Then he will send you the Christ he has predestined, that is Jesus, whom heaven must keep until the universal apocatastasis comes which God proclaimed, speaking through his holy prophets. Unquote. This is not the word that is usually used in English translations. The usual word is restoration, till the universal restoration comes, but we will use the original word apocatastasis. Jung refers to the use of the term by the prophets for the return of the Jews to their homeland from the Babylonian exile. The restoration of the temple was referred to as the apocatastasis. In another place, Jung suggests that Paul may have acquired the idea of the apocatastasis from his Hebrew teacher, Rabbi Gamaliel the Elder. Jung describes the rabbi as a Jewish Gnostic and suspects that Gamaliel may have taught Paul the old tradition about paradise, that after Adam and Eve were expelled from the garden, the garden was no longer any good having been damaged in the same way that the Imago Dei in man had been damaged. And for that reason, God moved paradise into the future. In the future, there will be a messianic age and a return to paradise. That will be an apocatastasis, a return of the original ordering of things. The term apocatastasis corresponds to the platonic idea of anamnesis, or what is called recollection. Jung uses the term anamnesis in the platonic sense that as we acquire consciousness, knowledge, all our learning is only a remembering of prenatal knowledge. All our cognition is no more than re-recognition, a remembering of what we once knew and had forgotten. We find this same archetypal idea in T.S. Eliot's poem, Little Gidding. Quote, we shall not cease from exploration and the end of all of our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time." Unquote. This archetypal theme is important to Jungian analysis because analysis is just that, a deliberate, orderly process of anamnesis which starts with a recollection of the personal life and then keeps going deeper. The term apocatastasis was also used in early Christian doctrine in the first two or three centuries. The doctrine stated that all free moral creatures, angels, men, and devils, would ultimately be saved. Origen, one of the Christian fathers, subscribed to this doctrine. 
which in its complete form stated that even the devil would be saved. The doctrine was formally branded a heresy at the Council of Constantinople in 543. Origen was a favorite of Jung, who quotes him many times in Ion, starting with this chapter. His dates are approximately 185 to 254. He was born in Alexandria, a Greek Egyptian city of Christian parents. His father, Leonides, was a teacher of Greek rhetoric and grammar and supervised his son's education. Origen was a precocious, brilliant pupil of both Greek culture and the Hebrew scriptures. When he was 17 years old, his father was martyred in a persecution. This was when he began his career as a teacher of grammar. He quickly gained a sizable reputation. The Bishop of Alexandria appointed him master in the catechetical school when he was only 18. Origen combined this work with study and interpretation of the scriptures. He, along with Plotinus, was a pupil of Ammonius Saccas, the great Neoplatonic philosopher. So Origen was saturated with the whole of Greek philosophical wisdom and also the Hebrew scriptures and the recent Christian material. He was a voluminous writer. His most important work was called Peri Archon, Archon colon, the same word that archetype comes from. The title is generally translated as the first principles. Origen would be especially honored by Jungians because he first put forth the heretical idea of the ultimate salvation of the devil. That means that Origen already foresaw the potential healing of the Christian split that was just then happening. Now we are in a position to understand his prescient wisdom. In paragraph 74 to 76, Jung tells us that although the figure of Christ has gathered symbols of wholeness around itself, still, in regard to the opposites, good and evil, it remains one-sided. Quote, if we see the traditional figure of Christ as a parallel to the psychic manifestation of the self, then the Antichrist would correspond to the shadow of the self, namely the dark half of the human totality, which ought not to be judged too optimistically. So far as we can judge from experience, light and shadow are evenly distributed in man's nature that his psychic totality appears, to say the least, in somewhat murky light. The psychological concept of the self, in part derived from our knowledge of the whole man, but for the rest depicting itself spontaneously in the products of the unconscious as an archetypal quaternity bound together by inner antinomies, cannot omit the shadow that belongs to the light figure, for without it, this figure lacks body and humanity. In the empirical self, light and shadow form a paradoxical unity. In the Christian concept, on the other hand, the archetype is hopelessly split into two irreconcilable halves, leading ultimately to a metaphysical dualism, the final separation of the kingdom of heaven from the fiery world of the damned. Paragraph 76. Examples of this irrevocable split in the Christian psyche are seen in medieval pictures of the Last Judgment. Footnote, for an example, see my Anatomy of the Psyche, page 205. They are all essentially the same. The upper half of the picture is the scene of heaven where the choirs of the blessed surround the heavenly throne. There is light and joy and order. Then about halfway down the picture, there is a line, an absolute schizoid line, and below it, the chaos of hell, where the damned are. It is the picture of the Christian psyche, and this is why Origen's notion of the possible salvation of the devil is so significant. He held out the idea that the split need not be perpetual, that there might be a reconciliation sometime. As long as that split exists, everyone is going to do his best to identify with heaven. But as we know psychologically, Whenever such a one-sided identification exists, it generates its opposite in the unconscious. 
Sooner or later, the swing over to the opposite takes place. This leads Jung to say, the coming of the Antichrist is not just a prophetic prediction, it is an inexorable psychological law.